Hi, everyone, and welcome, and thank you so much for uh, joining us today. So my name is Genevieve Antono. Everyone calls me Jeannie, and I will be your moderator for today. To give a bit of background, I'm a 3L uh, here at Harvard Law School, and I'm also the co-president of HALB, which is the Harvard Association for Law and Business. Um, so HALB is, you know, one of the biggest busiest student organizations at Harvard Law School and we pride ourselves on a lot of things. We pride ourselves on, you know, having a really great culture, having, you know, a really close knit, you know, community of friends that's like really supportive. And we also pride ourselves on, you know, bringing you, um, you know, high quality programming that, you know, hopefully adds a lot of value. Um, so today's webinar is actually our first in, you know, our brand new series uh, called uh, The Beginner's Guide to Corporate Practice. Uh, so this series is targeted at, you know, two L's who are preparing for on-campus interviews in January and also at one L's who are, you know, just kind of like exploring corporate practice, trying to figure out what you want to do uh, with your lives, your careers, right? Um, so over the course of this semester, we're going to have a lot of webinars like intro to capital markets, intro to M&A, intro to hedge funds, so on and so forth. And if that sounds uh, interesting to you guys on the call, make sure that you are on the HALB newsletter because that's where all, you know, the announcements and the registration links are going to go out. Um, so I'm hoping that this is going to be a really fun, really substantive um, series and that, you know, all of you are going to just learn a lot. And I'm super, super excited about today's webinar, which is Intro to Private Equity Funds um, with Maya Reeves, uh, Nathalie Harand, and Michael Wallitzer from Simpson Thatcher. For me, you know, like Simpson Thatcher and, uh, you know, private equity funds basically go together like peanut butter and jelly, right? So the firm has, you know, represented private equity uh, clients for over 40 years, and it's played a really prominent role um, in, you know, the development of the private funds industry. Um, it's probably not an exaggeration to say that, you know, STB is the world's uh, leading legal advisor in the private equity sector. And, you know, it's won a, 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 you know, a ton of awards um, from the STB website. Uh, there's a, you know, like Chambers Global Band One Ranking and Global Wide Investment Funds, Private Equity Fund Formation, Law 360 Private Equity Practice Group of the Year, uh, top two law firms in global private equity announced deals by value in eight of the last 10 years, uh, represented the sponsor in five of the largest leverage acquisitions ever completed, so on and so forth. For me, I'm really excited that today's introduction uh, for private equity funds is with Michael Walzer, who is the head of the firm's investment funds practice, as well as from Maya Reeves and Nathalie Harand, who are both um, associates at the firm. But that's enough from me <laughs> as an introduction. So um, let's, let's, let's jump in with introductions. Um, so Michael, uh, Maya, and Nathalie, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Uh, can, can, you, can we go around and just kind of like introduce ourselves? Can you tell us your name, um, if you're an associate, what year you're in, uh, where you went to law school, why you chose Simpson, and maybe one thing that people don't know about you. Hi everyone, my name is Natalie. I'm, I guess, gonna be a third year associate now at Simpson. I went to NYU for law school and Duke for undergrad. Um, I spent a couple of summers at Simpson. I did the SEO program and then also spent my 1L and 2L summers at the firm. Um, so I guess I just couldn't get enough, but I chose Simpson because of the people and the strength of the practice areas. I felt like as a summer, I really got um, good sub substantive experience and had a sense of what you know, my career would be like as an attorney at a corporate law firm. Um, and then one thing that people don't know about me, or maybe they don't know, I have four sisters. So I'm the fourth out of five. Say, Natalie, I didn't know that you had uh, four sisters. So that's nice. That's, um, hi, guys. My name is Maya Reeves. I am a fourth year, rising fifth year associate here at the firm. Um, I went to Columbia for law school and University of Michigan for undergrad. Um, I came to the firm similar to Natalie as an SEO um, when I was, I, I see that go blue, um, when I was a 1L, we did not have a 1L program, so I went to another firm um, and I came back as a 2L and then spent the remainder of my career here. Um, I, uh, I think I chose to come back to Simpson similar to what Natalie said because of the people. I met some really wonderful people as an SEO. Um, I think oftentimes in recruiting, uh, 
you, you get sort of the A team, the, the, the folks that the firm wants you to see that are really personable, really outgoing, really gonna sell the firm well. Um, and, and I loved all of those people, but I think I was impressed with Simpsons like B team, so to speak. Um, I just, people who were not involved in recruiting heavily at all, just really went out of their way to make me and the other SEOs my year feel very welcomed um, and just teach us about what their practices look like. And uh, going to school in the city, uh, I continued to make, remain in contact with a lot of the people that I had met as an SEO. Um, and I think that was really wonderful. And folks kind of really went to bat for me to come back to the firm and we, I built those relationships and you know, seven years later, they're, they're still going strong. I also saw a quick question before I, we turn it over to Michael. Um, we are all out of the New York office. Thanks, Maya. You didn't give us uh, a thing about you that's unique or people oh, don't know. Oh, that's true. Um, things that I don't know. Everyone at the firm knows this, but you guys don't know this because you don't know me. I am like the biggest Ed Sheeran fan in the entire world. So. <laughs> So uh, thanks guys, it's Michael Wolitzer. Um, I went to Duke as well and I uh, graduated from Columbia Law School. Um, you know, I chose Simpson in the late eighties. It was, you know, it was different, but it was the same. You know, uh, it was one big corporate practice. And when I didn't know what part of corporate I was gonna go into, but I, what I knew was across the board, Simpson was top ranked top, you know, five at the time. You know, some were number one, some were number two, but everything was such a high, highly ranked, highly regarded corporate practice that I figured whatever area I went into, I would do fine because every area was so well regarded. Little did I know that I would end up in a practice area that in 1989 didn't exist, um, meaning private funds and what it's grown into today. So um, it was really that. And then combined with, of course, um, the people, I, I felt like, you know, it had great people, but it didn't have like a distinct, unique personality, that it was very accepting of all types of people, and that there was a commitment to excellence and a commitment to, um, to good work, but people were good to each other. And it was really that that drew me to the firm. Um, and I'm glad I'm still there um, 30, 32 years later. Um, as far as the one thing that people don't know about me, I'd say uh, it surprises them is that um, I have a pretty regular yoga practice and that I do stand on my head. Um, maybe people think I stand on my head in my practice um, in terms of some of my ideas that I think of, but I actually do stand on my head as part of my yoga practice. So that's the one thing that people don't know about me. I love right? it. Can we get pictures? <laughs> <laughs> we'll see. We'll see. All right, so next we are going to jump into the teaching segment of our webinar and they're going to be slides and I'm going to be clicking through them. So, you know, Maya, uh, Natalie, Michael, um, feel free to give me verbal cues like, you know, like go forward, go backward, etc. So question number one, what is a private equity fund? Um, so let, let's back up a tiny bit before we say what a private equity fund is. Um, the, all of these, all of the funds that we practice in and other types of funds fall under the category of what we would call asset management. Um, so, you know, in folks, typically high, um, high net worth individuals are really looking for ways to grow, grow their money um, and are looking for investment products that they can invest in that they don't necessarily have to manage themselves. Um, and so within the asset management space, you have sort of mutual funds, hedge funds, and then private equity or private funds. Um, private equity is a specific subset of private funds, but we often refer to the two interchangeably. Um, here at Simpson, we don't really focus on mutual funds at all. Um, we have a small focus on hedge funds, um, which we will discuss a little bit later in the presentation. But for the most part, we're going to sort of focus on private equity and private funds in, in this presentation. Um, you can go forward. So, so there's no uniform definition of, of a private fund. Um, historically, private equity funds only invested in sort of equity investments. Um, we'll speak a little bit later about what other types of investments there are covered under the private equity umbrella today. Um, at, at its most basic, a, a private fund is something we would call a collective investment vehicle where you're having lots of different individuals or entities pooling their money and, and that money is then being invested for them. That's sort of the basic. There are some variations on that that don't involve exactly like pooled money. You might have smaller uh, 
individual type investments, but we, we can leave that aside for now. Um, and, and like I said, historically, these, these investment vehicles were only investing in private equity. Now there are various types of strategies, um, including the ones that you see listed, buyout where the, the fund is actually gonna go make a control type investment, um, real estate where the fund is going to go and make real estate investments, debt or credit where you're actually going to invest in debt products, credit, um, credit products, mezzanine, which specific type of debt, um, secondary where you're actually going and making investments, but you're buying them from individuals or other investors who have held that investment on a primary basis and for whatever reason are looking to get out of that investment. Um, sort of opportunistic investments where you're really sort of taking advantage of, of, of a specific moment, a specific um, situation. For example, right now we're, we're seeing with COVID, we're seeing a number of funds that are looking to make investments sort of opportunistically based on the, um, the, the opportunities that are being created by, by the displacement in the market. Um, I think we can go forward. So um, some, just some, I guess, quick uh, um, characteristics. Um, private funds are typically very, very highly illiquid. Um, a lot of the disclosure that you'll see that we'll talk about focuses on really sort of making sure that the investors understand that the investment that they're going to be making is very long term and there's not a lot of not a lot of opportunity for them to get out of that investment once it's been made and there's not a lot of opportunity for them to control or direct um, the you know direct that investment you're, you're really relying on the manager um, which typically is who Simpson represents um, sometimes funds will have a geographic focus. They may invest globally. They may invest in a specific region. Michael and I have a client together that in, only really does LATAM investing. I have some other clients that, you know, invest only in the United States. Uh, I've worked on products where they invest, you know, only, only in Asia. Um, and then just a little bit about some of the types of investors that come into these types of products. They're typically very sophisticated investors. Um, and because they're sophisticated, they're exempt from many of the securities and, and regulatory framework that you would see in a more traditional type securities practice, like in a capital market. Um, the investors are typically a mix of US and non-US institutional investors, sovereign wealth funds, pension funds, endowments, universities. Um, other types of foundations, family offices, et cetera. And then you actually have high net worth individuals. And depending on the size of the fund and the type of investing, the, there's a range in what we mean by high net worth. There are sort of minimum standards that are set by Securities Act and some uh, additional regulatory frameworks, which we'll talk about later at the end of the presentation that sort of really make these investors eligible. Something else to know that the, the terms of these these products are really driven by your strategy, investment portfolio, liquidity, tax considerations, market sponsor conventions. So, so what that means is, you know, different sponsors have their idea of how they want to get this done. So they're, they're maybe the Blackstone way or the, the Carlisle way. Um, and then, you know, if you're investing in, in, you know, for example, if you're investing in Brazil, there are very specific tax regulatory frameworks that are going to dictate the structuring of your fund. Um, your, what else, else is going to dictate the structuring of your fund is how long you're planning to hold these investments, how long the fund is going to ex be in existence, um, and other types of considerations like that. You, you know, your terms may be materially different if you're focusing on real estate versus focusing on infrastructure versus, versus focusing on a tr traditional buyout type structure. So the, the basics about the fund structure and sort of all the players. Um, you're going to have typically a limited partnership. Sometimes it will be um, a limited liability company or other type of vehicle, but I think a limited partnership is, is most common. And the limited partnership can be set up in sort of any jurisdiction, but the jurisdictions that, that I think we see most common are uh, Delaware, Cayman Islands, and Luxembourg. Um, obviously that can change. Michael and I have a client that primarily only uses Ontario vehicles, so that's a little different. Um, and then you have, um, in terms of the players, you have the fund sponsor, which like I said, Simpson typically represents sponsors. And uh, you'll hear us refer to a sponsor or a general partner or a manager somewhat interchangeably. They may be um, specific different vehicles that are owned by our clients. But when we are saying the sponsor or the GP, that's, that's what we mean, we mean our clients, as opposed to sort of the parties on the other side who would be the limited partners or the investors, sort of the same, same folks. Um, you know, the, the sponsors are really going to be dictating uh, some, most of the terms of the investment and, and 
the direction of the investments and making the sort of investment decisions, whereas the limited partners are really going to fund the capital to actually make the investments. Um, because they're putting up their money and they're very sophisticated, they make many, many demands on what the terms of the fund will actually be. And that's kind of where we, we come in helping to negotiate those things. I think we can move on. Um, and then sort of before, wrapping up on the private equity basics, um, some just really basic terms to know, uh, our, our clients, the sponsors take fees, management fees for the privilege of managing your money. Um, typically one to two percent of the LP's commitment during the investment period. So during the period in which in the investments can actually be made and then um, one to two percent on invested capital thereafter. So after you can no longer make investments in the life of the fund, one to two percent on how much is actually has actually been invested. Um, that can differ a little bit depending on strategies and what LPs have negotiated, but that's kind of the, the most typical. Um, and then these funds typically have what we call a performance-based structure, performance-based compensation. Um, so in addition to the management fees, which can be you know, quite substantial in, in the aggregate, um, if the fund is doing well, our, our clients are going to take what we call carried interest, or you'll hear us refer to it as carry. Um, carried interest is usually a specified percentage of the fund's profits um, attributable to the capital that was invested by the LPs. A really typical number is like 20%. Um, and then it's typically taken on realized investments, i.e. investments that have been disposed of, um, and it is often subject to a hurdle or a clawback, meaning that you're not just going to get 20% of whatever the profit is. There's, there's sort of a an or priority of distributions that you have to go through first to make sure that everyone is kind of aligned, and if there's not enough money to go around, um, you're not just taking 20% of of the profits before LPs are getting their money back or, or things like that. Um, and then the clawback, meaning sometimes there are sort of contingent obligations, you know, after the life of the fund, which is really sort of more of an LP give back. Um, but also there may be a scenario in which the general partner is getting more carry than they should. It may have made sense on a deal basis, but it maybe doesn't make sense on the basis of the entire fund. And so if you look at it from that perspective, the general partner is maybe getting more than that 20% that we said they should be getting. So uh, LPs will demand that they can claw back that money. Um, it's not exactly perfect and it's highly negotiated. Um, and then it's sort of the typical hurdle um, that we're talking about is like this 8% per annum. And what that means is usually after you've returned the LPs money, everything that they've invested to actually buy the investment and everything that they've invested in terms of fees, so lawyers' expenses, et cetera, um, they usually get the first 8% back of, of profit. And so our clients taking that 20% of profit, it's subject to them getting this 8% first and some other there's some other things in between the, the hurdle and the 20%, but uh, that's kind of basically how it works. Um, and then, you know, sort of this really important concept is this return on invested capital. The profits are generated based on the capital that is invested in the fund by, by the fund sponsor. Lastly, so you've got, um, there are some other so, uh, like functions and, and characteristics of, of private equity funds, just in time funding, i.e. Um, asking LPs to sort of make investments, make additional capital com contributions um, as needed for certain investments. We're seeing that a lot during COVID. Um, as you can imagine, many of these investments may now be distressed. Um, for example, if you own a shopping mall, people aren't really shopping right now. Um, and then the proceeds are, are distributed generally in cash upon disposition of investments or when current income is received, um, meaning that our sponsors are gonna give this out once the investments have been sold or realized um, and then current income is a little I, I think we can actually kind of skip it right now just because I don't, I don't I think it's a little technical for where you all, all are in the investment but I'm happy to answer questions on it later um, there's a concept called recycling in these funds where um, sponsors can reinvest some of the gains there's usually limitations on how much of the gains can be reinvested um, and there's usually limitations on how long they can can do that um, oftentimes only during the investment period as we said the period during which the fund can actually make investments um, but basically this allows the fund sponsor to invest more than the lps have actually committed so if the lps have committed a hundred dollars they may actually end up funding 120 dollars over the life of the fund 
Um, the, the funds that we typically represent are what we call closed ended funds, meaning that there is a lifetime to the fund. Um, at, by the terms of the fund, the fund will dissolve at some point. Um, as you can see down below, the, the typical is about eight to 12 years in a, in a typical structure. It can get a little bit longer and longer hold funds and it can be shorter sometimes. Um, and then there's usually limited ability to get in and out of the fund, which is what we were talking about, these funds being highly illiquid. Um, you can usually transfer your rights subject to certain limitations within the terms of the documents, um, but you then have to kind of find either a buyer that's an affiliate of yours or a non-affiliate and get permission and kind of go through this negotiation process. But, um, and they're very, very limited ability to withdraw wholesale. Um, withdrawing wholesale sort of it, it's typically tied to like regulatory needs. Um, you know, you're going to violate some sort of law or regulation to which you're subject by, by remaining in the investment. Um, there's usually a fixed subscription period, about, about one year is pretty typical, sometimes maybe a little bit longer, maybe up to like 18, 24 months, um, during which time LPs can actually come into the fund, they can make commitments to the fund. Um, and to the extent that any investments are made during that period and, and LPs actually have to fund capital before all of the LPs that will finally be in the fund come in, there are sort of equalization mechanisms that sort of try to account for that and true up to make sure that everyone is sort of bought into the old investments and interest has been paid because you know, your, your capital has been used earlier. Um, and then finally, we've been talking about this investment period. So a period of, during which time the fund can actually go out and make investments, buy companies, buy assets. And that's typically about three to six years in a, in a fund that's typically about eight to 12 years long. Next, can you walk us through a basic private equity fund structure? So this is the structure chart. Sure. So building off of what Maya was saying, um, at the top, you'll see the sponsor. Typically in our fund structures, you'll have a general partner. The general partner basically is in charge of the day-to-day -day operations of the fund. They help make the investments. And then you'll also have an investment advisor who advises um, on the investments that are being made. Um, going lower into the structure, you'll have a main fund. So that's typically the vehicle where investors will subscribe to. It'll have them with the capital commitments. Um, oftentimes it'll be a Delaware vehicle. And then we also have this concept of parallel funds. So these funds will invest and divest on the same terms um, as the main vehicle. And they're usually set up for either tax or regulatory reasons. Oftentimes you'll see, um, like a lot of the funds that I work on will have a Luxembourg parallel vehicle. And then um, the investors that are coming into there usually have specific attributes. Um, you'll also see on the structure chart, deal specific co-investments. So co-investments are typically um, a small, it's kind of like a fundraise. It's usually on an accelerated timeline, but if there's a specific investment or asset that the fund wants to make, they can set up a co-investment vehicle. Um, you may have investors that are in the main fund also participate in that investment, and there could be other third-party investors that come in, but once the investment is made, it's kind of over, so it doesn't have the same um, sort of like life cycle and fundraising process that the funds that Maya was discussing would have. Natalie, maybe I'll just yeah. chime in on the question that came through the Q&A. Yeah. So this is the basic building blocks. We've obviously very much simplified this. Just to address a second question that came in earlier, you know, we have eight offices. Um, well, this firm has 11 offices, but we have eight offices around the world where we practice private funds. So we have um, five offices in the US, which is uh, New York, DC, Houston, LA, and Palo Alto. And then we have London to cover Europe, and then we have Tokyo and, um, and Hong Kong to cover um, Asia, where we have funds, people, senior funds people practicing. The question that came through is, well, how does an Asia fund different, differ? And again, as Maya pointed out, you know, many of the ge geographies and strategies will end up with their own structure, but this is the basic building block. Some sort of vehicle, usually with the general partner and the advisor is active, and the limited partners are relatively passive, and there's a vehicle where the money is collected and deployed into investments. As far as Asia funds specifically, I would say Asia funds tend to not use US structures. They tend to use non-US structures. Um, most of the time, um, uh, Cayman Islands is probably the most popular for Asia funds. You know, Hong Kong is actually developing its own limited partnership structure. We'll see if that takes off. But for right now, I'd say Cayman is the most popular. And you'd see this kind of GPLP structure using a Cayman Islands vehicle. 
um, for, for Asia funds. India might have a different structure um, dealing with uh, Singapore or Mauritius to take advantage of some treaty benefits. So again, there's not a one size fits all, but generally speaking, to answer your question, it's this basic framework probably leaning toward Cayman. Michael, there, there was another question. It says, for clarification, would the sponsor parent company at the top of the chart typically be a big bank like Bank of America or Chase? I mean, I would say the banks have generally moved out of, of this business. Typically speaking, the sponsors are private investment firms. Um, uh, some of them are public. That, that wouldn't have been true uh, 20 years ago, but a lot of the big sponsors now like Blackstone and KKR and Carlisle and others are all public companies, but they're not banks. They're public companies that do asset management and related services. Um, most of the sponsors by number are gonna be independent, privately owned firms that engage in one or more strategies to invest capital. That, that's the most common um, client, if you will. Like I said, there are several public companies. There are a handful of, of banks that are in this business, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley definitely have have this business and they do it um, you, you know volker put some restrictions on that that they've worked around but generally speaking the private investment business tends to be either private independent sponsors or in the last 10 years some multi-strat public sponsors which are very large um apollo aries oak tree i mean there's about seven or eight of them that, that are well known but, but again, it's largely still a privately owned sponsored business um, as a general matter. Um, so just quickly, can you tell us about the life cycle of a typical fund? So typically what will happen is you'll have investor, well, so the sponsor will want to raise a fund um, and investors will provide capital to the sponsor. They'll subscribe using subscription documents for the firm to invest and then the sponsor will go out, make those investments, and then they will improve the company, um, either implement new management, and then they'll hold that investment for a set number of years. Um, and then hopefully they'll sell the investment for profit. Um, usually they'll, like Maya had mentioned before, return the capital to 80% of the capital to investors, and then they'll get 20%. So in terms of just getting into the details of the fundraising process and closing, as a junior associate, this is definitely something that you're expected to kind of know and be really heavily involved in. Um, so once you understand the client's goals, you'll help them put together their offering documents for the fund. So that'll be the offering memorandum. It has typically a number of sections that are kind of consistent across sponsors, but it may vary. But you'll have a set of disclosures at the front, and then you'll have a business overview or a marketing overview. You might have some information about the business professionals that are managing the company and overview of the sponsor and sort of their history and track record. And then you'll have a term sheet that describes the terms of the offering. And then you'll have a set of risks and conflicts, which is um, a pretty lengthy uh, section of the PPM, as we call it. Um, and that just sort of sets forth all of the potential risks and conflicts that could arise with this transaction. Um, we wanna make sure that investors are making informed decisions. And there's a number of different regulatory laws that kind of inform um, what kind of disclosure we include in the PPM. We also uh, prepared the partnership agreement. Um, I think later in the presentation we explain what it is, but it's basically the document that sort of governs the rights of the investors and sort of it's the main governing document for the fund. And then you have subscription documents, so that's how LPs, investors will sign up to be in the fund. Um, so once we've prepared the documents and posted them for investors to review, typically what will happen is investors will do due diligence, they'll review the documents, and then we'll engage in negotiations with them. So even though the partnership agreement is the main sort of governing document that sets forth the terms and obligations, oftentimes investors will want to either negotiate provisions that are within the partnership agreement or due to um, the investor's jurisdiction or the type of entity that they are, they have certain obligations. So a lot of times either like pension funds will have certain reporting obligations that they um, need to comply with. And so they want to ensure that if they're going to be investing in this fund, the sponsor can, you know, kind of work with them to meet their obligations as well. And after we go through the negotiation process, which usually takes um, a couple months, it depends on the timeline of your fund, you'll have your initial closing. So 
we'll finalize the side letters with the investors, we'll finalize the partnership agreement, and then you'll hold a closing. So basically what happens is once the investor subscription documents are complete, we let them know that the sponsor has accepted their commitments and then the sponsor can go ahead and start deploying the capital that they've committed. Um, there may also be subsequent closings where additional investors come in. And then once um, sort of the fundraising period has ended, we engage in an MFN process so for mo most favored nations. So what will happen is investors typically have a provision in their side letter that says, that subject to certain provisions and if they're applicable or not, they can elect to get sort of the best provision that other investors received. Um, and that process is pretty time consuming, but also really interesting because you get to see the scope of provisions that are given on any given topic. Um, and then there's a, additional ongoing work um, once the fund raise is sort of over, but that's generally the life cycle. What are some of the basic fund documents? So we'll go into detail uh, into some of the documents you've mentioned earlier. So as I mentioned before, the PPM is the main offering document. Um, this document, I kind of went through the sections, but I think the risks and conflicts are probably the most important section aside from the term sheet. Um, it helps protect the sponsor against risk. It's sometimes drafted a bit dramatically, I would say, in terms of it's really setting forth any possible risk that could occur. Um, some of the most recent risks that we've had to draft are related to COVID um, and sort of the liquidity issues that can happen, uh, the performance of investments and what investors um, can expect in terms of how the sponsor will be able to perform, whether or not they'll be able to get um, financing, et cetera. Then you have the limited partnership agreement. So this is the main document that governs the rights and obligations of the investors. Um, as I mentioned, investors can negotiate different terms if they don't agree with how the partnership agreement is drafted. Um, and then you have a subscription agreement. So this is the contract where investors, it's, it starts with the representations and warranties section. So investors will um, basically rep that they meet certain requirements, that they've read all of the offering documents that we've provided, that they're making an informed decision. Um, they make representations with respect to their status as a status as an ERISA investor or not. Um, they agree to inform the sponsor if there's any changes to their tax status. Um, there's also provisions about the governing law of the agreement um, and data privacy and information rights. And then there's a section that's a questionnaire. So the investor will say the type of entity they are, They'll make representations with respect to their status as an accredited investor and a qualified purchaser, and they'll provide just some basic like contact information, bank details, et cetera. Um, so side letters, as I mentioned, are ancillary agreements that investors use to sort of negotiate specific provisions from the partnership agreement. Um, it supplements the LPA. These are, I think, um, probably the most time consuming and interesting um, documents to draft because you really have to think about the provisions that we've included in the LPA and how this can affect certain LPs and you know whether or not the sponsor wants to agree to things and if you agree to it with one person there's a risk that during the MFN process other investors will be able to elect it so you really have to carefully think about whether or not the obligations that your client is agreeing to are is something that you know they're willing to adhere to for however long the fund um, is in existence. And then you'll have an advisory agreement. So as we mentioned, there's often an investment advisor. Um, and this is just your con the contract between the advisor and the fund. And then there's other offering materials, um, pitch books and diligence questionnaires. So what are some of the types of funds that exist and how do they differ? Sure. So um, you have what we call our traditional private equity funds. Um, with pr traditional private equity funds, we're, we're often we'll refer to them as buyout funds. Um, typically they acquire a substantial or quote unquote controlling stake in a private or public company that they then intend to take private. Um, you may have a specific strategy to invest in public investments, um, but that's a specific type of fund and, and, and not, uh, not as common. Um, I think there was a question around here that is actually related to this. Ah, right. Um, can, can you briefly explain why private equity funds are illiquid and how the control and influence work? And I think this is probably a good time to answer it. Um, 
private equity funds are sort of illiquid based on the nature of the investments that are being made. Once you go buy a company, um, you know, let's say Dunkin' Donuts, um, you, you can't really pull your money out of that company until you sell it. Um, so it's sort of just some, some necessarily illiquid. Um, it creates all kinds of accounting and regulatory issues if if you are coming in and out of the fund. Um, and I guess you could exit your interest in the fund, um, maybe your obligations to continue uh, funding capital and you know your your ob and your ability to vote, et cetera. But you still wouldn't be able to get your money out of the fund um, because the, the the investment just hasn't been sold. Um, in terms of the control and influence, when we say we're buying controlling stakes that may be 50% or more of the company, but it may be a smaller percentage that has the majority of the voting rights. And, and what will happen is our sponsors will uh, typically put some of their employees or the, the employees of like the asset management portion of the, the sponsor on the boards of these companies. And then from there, they make the controlling decisions about the companies. Um, and so in addition to traditional private equity buyout funds, you might have a real estate opportunity fund, um, which is formed to opportunistically acquire interest in, in real, real property or real estate related to companies. So hotels, casinos, um, it, it's still somewhat of a, uh, it's still somewhat similar to the other type of fund. It's just a different type of asset class that you're focused on. Um, similar, uh, similarly, you have infrastructure funds same basic concept, except again, you're gonna be focused on infrastructure assets as opposed to equity or as opposed to real estate. Um, think about you know, pipelines, bridges, toll roads, et cetera. Um, then you have tactical opportunity funds, which typically pursue investments on an opportunistic basis, which we kind of discussed. Um, these, they can be multi-asset class based on prevailing market conditions. So as we, we talked about, there are a number of conditions that are being um, that we're seeing caused by COVID and we're seeing investing that has been somewhat uh, focused on, on that. Um, so in addition, you have debt funds where you typically pursue non-controlling strategies um, that seek to make debt investments in portfolio issuers. So just like you can go to a, a bank and get debt, you can also go to a private fund and, and get debt. Um, we, we talked about the fact that there are hedge funds and we don't focus as much of our practice on hedge funds. Um, hedge funds typically are more liquid than a traditional private equity fund. Um, they uh, tend to make investments in publicly traded stocks and bonds. So although it's a fund and you're not, um, you're not investing your money directly the way maybe you would if you went and bought stock of Google or Facebook or whatever it is, um, it, it gives you more ability to get out because the underlying asset can be sold more readily and the value can be realized more readily. Um, then you have open-ended real estate funds, which are formed to acquire more stable real estate assets for the long term. Um, think about something like acquiring like a, a rental property where you're really taking um, money from, from the rent that's coming in on, on a pretty stable basis. You have registered pub and publicly traded funds. So uh, these are funds that are actually registered on some sort of ex listed exchange, um, mutual fund, funds, permanent capital vehicles, um, and they can be designed for retail investors. We do have a significant component of our practice that focuses on registered funds, although Michael, Natalie, and I are all more in the, the private fund space, but we do have a portion of the group that focuses primarily on registered funds. Um, and then you I would just mention on that, sorry to interrupt, Maya. Yeah, go ahead. If any of you've met Rajiv Chanda, who's class of 2000 at Harvard, he runs our registered funds practice um, out of DC. And he's, I know he's a big um, cheerleader with, with Harvard and Harvard recruiting. So if you've met him, he, he is the person who actually runs our, our registered funds practice. Yep. And then finally, you just have a, a sort of smorgasbord of, of additional types of funds. You could have a, a VC, venture capital fund, um, hybrid funds that kind of combine strategies, secondary funds where, you know, we talked about briefly before that you're not going to necessarily invest on a primary basis. You're not going to go find a sponsor that's in the market and actually um, sign up those documents. You're going to go find an investor who has already been in the fund and they're looking to get out and like go buy their interests. 
Um, you could have a fund of funds where your strategy as a fund is to find other funds to invest in, and then those funds will do the primary investing. You could have permanent co-investment vehicles, or you could have individual co-investment vehicles, i.e. you could um, have a fund where their strategy is to just make co-investments, um, or you could have a single vehicle that, that is really established more for a deal where your, your other fund, your infrastructure fund, your private equity fund, for whatever reason, can't take up the full portion of the deal, and they go out and they raise additional capital to, to sort of cover that shortfall. And that may be covered by LPs who are in the fund already and they want to take up more of the deal themselves, or it could be true third-party investors. Um, you can have minority stakes vehicles where as sort of the opposite of you know, the traditional buyout where you're really only looking to take a minority stake. But there's a wide range of strategies that you, you can see. We've, we've seen strategies including um, investing in diverse managers or investing in, in general partners themselves. So if we could cover the basic regulatory framework in five to 10 minutes tops, that would be amazing. <laughs> yeah, I think we can because I think it, it gets pretty down in the weeds and we'll try to keep it pretty high level. Um, so you have a few acts which you're subject to, which are going to be listed out on it over the next couple of slides. The first of which is the U.S. Securities Act of 1933. Um, you all may not know, but investing in a fund is investing in securities. So we are still governed by the Securities Act and we're still governed by the SEC. Um, funds typically have a very narrow subset of types of offerings under the Securities Act, as, which is a little bit different from our capital markets colleagues that may see a wider range of types of offerings. So typically we have what we would call a Reg D offering for our U.S. investors um, or a Reg S offering for our non-U.S. investors. And because we're often marketing to U.S. and non-U.S. investors at the same time, we typically offer like combined Reg D, Reg S offerings and get reps to that support um, these types of offerings from everyone. Um, sometimes you'll have uh, for a much smaller offering, um, including for an SMA or a separately managed account, um, you'll under section 4A2. Um, and then funds relying on Reg D have to comply with bad actor rules. So we get um, reps from LPs that basically just say that you haven't committed certain enumerated bad action under Reg D. Um, typically under a Reg D offering, you have to you have to make your offering only to accredited investors. And there's like a number of ways that you can be considered an accredited investor. The SEC uses this concept as a proxy for sophistication and justifying their lack of involvement in the, reg in the regulation of these types of products. I think there was a question earlier about minimum wealth qualifications for who can invest in a private fund. This is where this would come into play. Um, there, up until fairly recently, accredited investing um, was tied almost exclusively to minimum wealth standards. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about it in a little bit, I think on the next slide or, or in a bit, um, you might also need to be a qualified purchaser for the type of offering that we're, we're, we're making and a qualified purchaser also has minimum wealth requirements. Um, finally, on this slide, there's generally no general solicitation. There are, there are specific types of funds that can can sort of generally solicit. Um, we typically do not advise our clients to, to offer those types of funds, although I had a client once insist. Um, and that kind of just means no general advertising, like no public offering, which is why if you've ever seen Simpson in the news for um, completing a fundraising, it's after the fundraising has actually finished. Um, so that way we, we can't say that our, ad, you know, our announcement of our involvement with this fund is, is an advertisement. So I think we can go for it. Um, the, the additional framework that you're subject to is the Investment Company Act of 1940. Um, private funds, uh, but for certain exemptions, would be considered investment companies and would be subject to the terms of the, the 1940 Investment Company Act, um, which we are seeking to avoid. Um, so the, the Investment Company Act requires registration of any issuer, which is primarily engaged in the business of investing, reinvesting, or trading in securities unless an exemption is available. And our sponsors typically rely on 3C7 exemptions, not exclusively, but typically. And that limits the offering to qualified purchasers, as I said, um, which for individual investors usually means having um, a net worth of $5 million. And for an entities usually means having a net assets of $25 million. There's, um, there are some details on the margins about how you, other ways you can qualify, but those are tr traditionally like the, the minimum standards. Um, there's also 3C1 exemptions. 
uh, which limits the offering to 100 beneficial owners of securities. In a 3C1 offering, folks don't need to be QPs, um, but it does have this sort of counting rule. And for and because the counting isn't super straightforward, oftentimes we see our, our sponsors relying more on 3C7 than 3C1. It also allows for like, larger offerings um, dollar-wise. Um, then you have 7D, non-issuers owned by non-US investors or non or US investors that are qualified purchasers. Um, we don't do those offerings as frequently as 3C7, but, but that's, that's also a possibility. There is what we call a KE or knowledgeable employee carve out, which can sort of exempt you from the minimum um, wealth standards. But what it means is that usually you have to be an employee of the sponsor who by function of your job, um, you have enough information about the investing to really make a sort of sophisticated uh, decision and, and the SEC doesn't feel the need to worry about your level, sophistication or knowledge. Um, and then there are certain exemptions for, for employees of security companies, um, which is a, se a separate part of, of the practice. And then you also have, we are also subject to the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. It's a little confusing with them both being from 1940 because we will often refer to them interchangeably as the, the 40 Act. Um, and, but the Advisors Act basically says that unless a sponsor qualifies for an exemption, that advisor must be registered as an investment advisor with the SEC. And so the SEC regulates in that way as well by, by overseeing the investment advisors themselves. Investment advisors have fiduciary duties to their clients, um, the utmost good faith to act in the best interest of the client and make full disclosure of all material facts. So we've been talking a lot about disclosure. Um, we, we want that both from a, um, a Securities Act perspective in the sense that uh, we have a disclosure-based system and a lot of things can be okay, just as long as you disclose them ahead of time before people make investments. But also we have obligations under the Advisors Act to, to make um, full disclosure of, of material facts. Um, invest, registered investment advisors are subject to various rules and requirements, including that advertising, um, including pre presentation of your track record, so uh, how your funds in the past have done, um, cannot be false or misleading. Um, and then they're also subject to Section 206 anti-fraud provisions, which apply to all advisors, whether they are registered or not. Um, there are additional types of advisors, including um, ex exempt reporting advisors that we're, we don't focus on as much because most of our clients fall on the registered spectrum, but they would also still be subject to Section 206, um, which essentially uh, basically says you can't commit fraud. Um, and then, for example, 206.3, um, has a prohibition on principal transactions without client consent. So thinking about a sponsor acting for their own account or buying or from or selling to a client without getting that client's consent, um, that, that would be picked up by the fraud provisions. Um, you also got the Securities and Exchange Act of 1934, um, specifically the Post Jobs Act. Post Jobs Act limits 2,000 holders of record of any class of equity securities to avoid a 12G registration, which basically means that uh, while 3C1 says that you can have no more than 100 investors. Um, the Exchange Act basically says you can't really have more than 2,000 investors in any particular class of equity securities. Um, we don't typically see offerings that large. So um, it, it is a limitation. It just doesn't often come into play. Um, then you also are subject, subject to CFTC. Um, many sponsors rely on a de minimis exemption for limiting commodity trading post 2012. Um, post the repeal of 4.13A4. Um, it, inclu it includes swaps as commodities. Um, typically, we just try to avoid this entirely. Um, I know that, Michael, do, do any of our sponsors really not not, this not the strategy that we're talking about. As you get into more trading strategies, CFTC comes into play. But usually, if you're doing an illiquid strategy, buying a company, buying real estate, the need for commodities is pretty de minimis, and you can meet the de minimis requirement. Um, so, sort of lastly, you're, you're also subject to ERISA, which is the Employee um, Retirement Income Securities Act, uh, which governs sort of uh, retirement assets. Um, there are specific fiduciary rules that you would have to comply with if your fund were to become what's called a plan assets fund. Um, and you would become a plan assets fund if you couldn't, couldn't satisfy one of the exemptions that we typically rely on. So for example, the 25% test, meaning that no more than 25% of the fund is uh, is ERISA money um, or sort of a VCOC or or, or REAC exemptions? Um, it depends on the the structure of the fund and the nature of the deals. But most of our sponsors um, 
comply with 25% or, or one of these other exemptions to avoid having to comply with the heightened fiduciary standards of ERISA. Um, there are tax overlays to all of this. Funds are typically treated as partnerships for US tax purposes, but um, that doesn't always work for LPs. So sometimes we create um, alternative investment vehicles um, or feeder funds that are sort of blockers, quote unquote, um, and it blocks certain types of incomes and filing requirements. And that's usually, uh, th those are all driven by, by tax. Um, there's wor a World Sky AFMID, AIFMD overlay, meaning that just because we're, a, we're US sponsors or our clients are US sponsors, or even if they're not, they're making a US offering, doesn't mean that there aren't other uh, you know, non-US overlays. So there are certain marketing requirements, et cetera, and other non-US jurisdictions that our, our sponsor clients need to be mindful of if they're going to go into those jurisdictions and try to market to entities or individuals from, from other jurisdictions. Um, they, they're going to need to comply with the securities laws in those jurisdictions. We're, we don't advise our clients on those, but we do sort of try to give them a quick overview and point them in the direction of of competent counsel and local counsel that they can talk to if they have more specific questions. Um, then there are sort of oftentimes local notification or registration requirements with local regulators, um, especially in Europe, um, following the, the, the passage and implementation of, of the AFM, AIFMD um, framework. And then finally, you have blue sky overlay, which is similar to world sky, except that it's focused on the United States as opposed to non-US jurisdictions. Um, our clients are still going to need to comply with the securities laws of each of the individual states that they are making offerings in, not only on the federal level. So what can uh, new private funds associates expect? And just as a time check, if we can do this in like a minute and a half, that would be great. <laughs> um, so as mentioned, Junior, new associates um, typically will help correspond with investors. You get a lot of investor contact early on, helping guide them through the subscription document process. Your job is to review the sub docs, make sure they've answered the questions correctly, make sure that they're cleared from a tax and an AML or anti-money laundering perspective. Um, you'll also help draft side letters. You'll draft sections of the PPM and the partnership agreement. Um, You'll also help with legal opinions, um, which is basically just uh, an opinion from the firm saying that, you know, we can attest to certain facts, um, the sponsors in good standing. Um, you'll help update checklists because of the life, the length of the life cycle of a fund. Um, being organized and staying on top of um, where everything is, the investors that have come in, the commitment amounts, um, what filings have been made, whether or not someone is an ERISA investor, specifically because if you um, are above the 25% test, you may become a fiduciary. Um, so there's a lot of tracking that is involved and you work with paralegals and different team members to help stay on top of everything. Um, junior associates also help put together closing emails. These are just emails that are sent to the investor once we've finalized all of the documents saying that the sponsor has accepted their commitment here are the documents for the, um, just so that they have a record of it. Uh, you also assist with transfers. So if an investor no longer wants to hold their interest in the fund, but they can't exit, they can transfer that interest subject to certain restrictions in the partnership agreement. Um, and so you have to put together essentially an agreement that says the interest is being transferred, the new transferee makes certain representations that are similar to what's in the subscription document, um, and they also have to be cleared for tax and AML. You also help coordinate with a bunch of specialists, primarily tax and ERISA, but I, the one thing that I think is really interesting and that I like about our practice in Simpson is that you get to work with a lot of other teams. So I work with credit, I work with the Blue Sky team, the regulatory team, um, tax and ERISA obviously, but you're not just limited to funds. Um, one of the matters that I'm working on, I've been getting a lot of um, contact with the M&A team and real estate teams. And so it's good exposure to how other practice groups work and other people at the firm. Um, okay, well, those are all the points that are on this slide already. 
All right. And so that uh, is the presentation. Thank you so much, Natalie, Maya, and Michael. Um, so if you are a 1L or a 2L uh, in the audience, we hope that uh, you learned a lot. We wanted this presentation to be super substantive, and uh, I think it definitely was. Um, if you want to be, you know, if you're super inspired and you want to be, you know, a private funds attorney now and you want to write fan mail to STB Recruiting, their email address is legalrecruiting at stblaw.com. Dot com. In the final minute, Michael, can you give us any uh, words of wisdom? What do you want our 1Ls and 2Ls to know? You know, I think you got a flavor for the private funds industry and what do we do? It's very varied. You're kind of a renaissance lawyer. You know, the things I always liked about it is you do drafting, you do disclosure documents, but you do negotiate like a deal. Then after the fund is closed, you, know, you spend the next several years counseling clients and giving advice. So the aspects of it of drafting, then negotiating, and then counseling all in the same practice is what I think really um, is what kept, is kept it fresh for me and I think is very appealing to a lot of people who are trying to figure out what they want to do um, because it has uh, all of those different aspects. So that, that's probably the overarching thing that I would share, uh, Jeannie. All right. So thank you so much for joining us today. We will see you at uh, the next HALB webinar. All right. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye.